Let's pray and uh, let's get around the word. Lord, we thank you, Lord God. We thank you, Lord, that we can meet here together. Lord, and there might be restrictions, but Lord, but Lord, we thank you for what we can do rather than what we can't do at the moment. And we know that eventually we'll be back to how we were able to run church. But Lord, we just thank you that we can meet. Thank you that we can worship you. Thank you, Lord God, that this is the house of God, Lord. And Lord, it is um, great to be able to come as Christians back and to worship you. Um, even in the restrictions, still to be able to worship you from our hearts, Lord God. And um, to become, to be able to come and fellowship and, and hear the hear your word. So we thank you for social media and those, but there's nothing like gathering together and being together. So we thank you, Lord God, that uh, we're back to this, and we just thank you, Lord God, that you are here and that uh, you are touching us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, come with me to Romans eight and verse eighteen. Got a lot of favourite passages of scripture. Romans 8 is again one of my favourites. And we're just going to take this passage. So Romans 8, we're reading from 18 to 27. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Isn't that amazing scripture for right now? You know, the suffering that people are going through, even as Christians, the sufferings that we're going through, you know, the, the um, uncertainty, you know, that word unprecedented, um, that what we're going through now cannot be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. And if you think about who was writing this, it was Paul. And Paul talked about the sufferings that he went through. I mean, if people think they're suffering now, have a go at what Paul went through. You know, he was, he was a whole night in the ocean, day and night in the ocean. Imagine uh, that, you know, Bellamy wouldn't last 10 minutes. <laughs> He'd be eaten by a shark. And, uh, you know, he, he was whipped, um, he was uh, robbed, he, you know, all he, he goes through in Corinthians, all the things that he went through and um, for, for Jesus. And yet he's saying that I don't. I consider that whatever I'm going through right now does not compare with the glory that shall be revealed in me or revealed in us. Amen. Can I have an amen? amen. And then it goes on for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willing, not willingly, but because of Him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself will also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labours with birth pains together until now. And we've heard that word lately, haven't we, about birth pains, about you know, Matthew 24, Luke 21, you know, where Jesus said, when you see these things happening, it's the beginning of you know, birth pains, or the beginning of sorrows. And so here's... Um, Paul actually mentioning this word as well in a different scripture, but it actually ties together. And he says, not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grow within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption and the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray as we ought, for the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. But now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Amen. What an amazing passage. I just want to unpack that this morning. Because that word... Um, glory in uh, verse 18. You know, we always think of the word glory, but actually there's the Greek word doxa, and we think of that word as like, you know, when I go to glory, you know, in heaven. But actually, the Greek word doxa means the splendor, the brightness, the magnificence, excellence, and preeminence, dignity, grace, and majesty, the absolute inward or personal excellence of Christ, the majesty. So, not only is it talking about a future meaning, about our glorified bodies, but it also, remember, the Bible says we are being changed from glory to glory. That is doxa to doxa. That means that 
this magnificence and excellence, this dignity and grace, this inward personal excellence of Christ is actually, we're being changed from, you know, in increasingly that happening in our lives. Amen? Because the Bible says, as he is, so are we in this world. And so when we accepted Jesus in our lives, the whole process of sanctification is that less of me and more of him. Amen? Mm -hmm. So the more there is of him, the more that I'm actually being, um, that I'm ex expressing his glory and we're being transformed from glory to glory. Amen? Uh, the Bible says that when uh, Moses went up on the mountain and when he met God and when he looked in the face of God, that his face shone. But it talks about in, in the New Testament that he put a veil on his face because that glory was fading. Okay? I used to think it was because it shone so much that the children of Israel couldn't look on it and so he had to veil his face. No, the New Testament tells us that he put it there because it was a fading glory. Because there was the law and it was a fading glory. But the New Testament says that we are being changed from glory to glory with unveiled faces. Amen? Mm -hmm. So the veil is off. And, and the glory of God, that, that the Bible says that what we're going through now doesn't compare with the fact that the glory that's going to be revealed in us. And so that has a future meaning, but it actually has a present meaning because we're being changed from glory to glory. Amen? And that preeminence, that excellence, that splendor, that brightness of Christ is actually shining more and more as we walk in this life and as we allow the Holy Spirit to do that work of sanctification in us. And in um, verse 19 where it says, the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. You know, creation is waiting for us to be revealed. It's a, with an earnest expectation. And that word revealed is um, the Greek word um, apocalypsis. And uh, it's used 18 times in the New Testament, but 12 times it's the word revelation. There's a revelation that's, been, that's taking place, amen? The world is actually set. I believe in, in the midst of this crisis that people are seeing that Christ, a revelation that Christians have handled this differently than people in the world, amen? Because God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of love and power and sound mind. And so as you know, Bible-believing Christians, um, we don't fear what's happening. In fact, we already have, know what's happening because Jesus told us what was going to happen. And so um, we're, uh, we're, we're already prepared for it. Amen? It, doesn't, it shouldn't sneak up on any Christian because Jesus commented on this 2,000 years ago. He said, when you see wars and rumours of wars and pestilence and famine. But he said, you know, one, it won't harm you. Two, look up because your redemption is drawing nigh. And so we look with an expectation that there's a sign that Jesus Christ is coming and there's an excitement about that and there's a spring in our step about that, amen? Rather than looking at um, what's going on. I think someone said oh, um, most of the world's um, problems would be fixed if we um, turned off the TV. <laughs> because, because it's really just been driving this whole fear and the more that you feed on fear, I think fear's been more contagious than the virus itself. Amen. Yes. And as we feed, but we don't have a spirit of fear. We have an expectation because we know what this is all about. Amen. And we, we eagerly expect that. Yeah, that word revelation actually means laying bare, uh, making naked, a disclosure of truth, manifestation, or appearance. So. So um, it says the creation eagerly waits for us to be revealed. Now, here's an interesting thing that I discovered um, a little while ago, which actually changed the whole meaning of this verse. That word creation is the Greek word uh, katesis, and it's used 19 times in the New Testament. But it not only means creation, but it actually means created things or created beings. And so, the best, the best um, translation of this is actually in the King James Version. So I'm going to read again Romans 8, 19 to 22 in the King James Version because it actually makes it look a little bit different. Because it changes the word creation to creature three times. Okay? So in verse 19 it says, For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. That changes it. Because you and I are creatures. Amen? 
<laughs> we are God's creatures. We are at the top of the pecking order of all the creatures that, that was made. And it actually, so what it's saying is that the earnest expectation of human beings wait for the revealing of the sons of God. That's actually what it's saying. And then it goes on and it says, for the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but, but by reason of him who subjected the same in hope. That's talking about the fall. And then it says, because the creature itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain until now. So that changes the, the, what that means. Because at first it's all talking yeah, in the New King James and most of the translations it's just talking about creation. But because that word can be translated as creature, what it's saying is that the creature, human beings, are earnest, earnest, have earnest expectation of, the men, of men or women of those around you. So basically, everyone around you have an, has an earnest expectation of you being revealed as a son of God. Amen? And when you are revealed, what that does is actually brings them out of bondage. <laughs> Amen? Because when, when we are revealed as you know, who we are, that we're the sons of God, when you get born again, you're, now, you're not of Adam anymore, you're of Christ, you know, you're actually not of this world. You're, that's why that's why we should look different. Um, somebody who actually Wayne Alcorn, who leads um, Australian Christian churches, he said, if it became a criminal offence tomorrow to be a Christian, would there be enough to convict you? <laughs> you know? Do people know? Do people realise that you there's something different about you? And so, you know, God has placed us around people, and the more that we're revealed. Actually, the first people that need to know that we're a son of God is you. <laughs> Amen. You need to know who you are. You need to know your creation identity. You need to know that you've changed. You need to know that you're a son of God. And the more that, you know, the more that that's revealed, the more the people around you are going to be set free out of bondage. Amen? That's how it works. And so, the more we grasp this revelation that you're a son of God and a daughter of God and walk in your new creation identity and let the glory that is in you be revealed, the more that you are, re uh, that you are released from bondage and so is everyone around you and even creation itself. Amen? Amen? So I believe that this scripture has a present tense but also a future tense. And so, you know, when I... When I um, I, before I was um, full-time pastoring, I was working in Queensland. I worked for a company that does the, you know, the ratchet straps, the tie-down, tie-downs for trucks. And um, when I was, I was the, the Queensland manager, and you know, our our company did so well. Uh, our branch actually did so well. Um, that was back in the days when you had handwritten invoices, and so we had a state budget, and then we had a national budget, and. Um, you know, just because of the favour of God, I would I would just smash the our state budget every time. In fact, I started to hold back some of the invoices to give me a, a, a leg up for the next month. You can't do that now; it's all on computer. But they know in head office because what would happen is that say it was May, you know, um, say the last week of May, suddenly there were no invoices for the 28th, 29th, and 30th, and then they started coming through <laughs> in June. And so they got wind of it, and so they'd say, um, uh, they, you know, they knew I put them in a drawer. And uh, when it came, the head office would ring, and then they'd say, um, how are you going? They said, oh, we've made our state, budget, our, our state budget. How's the national budget going? Oh, we need a little bit extra just to get over the line. Could you send us a few more of those invoices? <laughs> I'd say, how much do you need? I'd only send them what they needed. But we had so much favour, and I had so much favour over my life and over the business, that um, we were able not only to always meet our budget, but also help the state meet theirs. And when I uh, left to go into full-time ministry, I rang my boss and I actually said, oh, look, I'm leaving. And he said, where are you going? What company is it? I'll do anything to match you to make sure you don't go. I said, well, I'm actually going into ministry. He goes, oh, I can't fight God. <laughs> 
<laughs> you must look pretty fit. Yeah, but do you know, uh, you know, I kept in contact with some of those guys, and you know, they were still the work that I'd done in that business. They were still reaping the benefits of that six years later. We're still coming into that business, and so, yeah. You know, here's the thing: is that when you when you're a son of God, you actually affect what actually happens around you, and business, even businesses. Um, I have a friend whose name is Alan Pillay, who actually is a pastor who is in uh, Pottsville. And uh, he, he won't mind me saying this because it's actually even been in newspapers and that, but uh, he was uh, working as a chaplain uh, for, for a build, the building company, Hutchinson's Builders. He was working for them. And um, so he would actually became a chaplain as well. And uh, he, decided to, um, he decided to leave and um, go into full-time ministry. Um, they asked him after, I think it was a few months later, they asked him to come back and, um, and he's now uh, a full-time minister but he's also a chaplain for that company. They asked him to come back, he said, because when you left, something changed. He said, it's like we lost our moral compass and he's, uh, it was notable to that company that he had left because when he left, he took that glory with him. And so they actually... Um, gave him a wage, they gave him an office because they wanted him back because they knew the influence that he brought. They might have not understand exactly why, but they noticed that something was missing when he left. And so we, you, you don't understand the influence that you have just by being where you are and the circle of the people. Um, Jenny will know what I'm talking about because Jenny's been a chaplain as well and uh, in, in New Zealand and um, you would know what I'm talking about. And so uh, you know, you have this influence because you carry the glory of God. Amen? You carry the glory of God with you and you bring peace, you bring the favour of God. You know, I, that company had so much favour because I was there. <laughs> and because Jesus was actually, um, you know, doing that favour through me. That's how it works. And so, so when we're revealed as the sons of God, people know it. They may not know it, they may not know until you leave, but they know there's something different. In fact, when I started telling people, my customers and that I was leaving and why, they said, I knew there was something different. There was something different about you. And um, so praise God. Um, in Romans 8.22, it says, For the whole, we know that the whole creation groans and labours with birth pains up until now. And do you know that um, it also says that um, creation is... Um, waiting for to be delivered. Now, so here's the thing, is that, do you know that we can actually um, change weather patterns? We can actually affect weather patterns because we're a child of God, do you know that? Um, when we were building our house, um, we were painting, we were painting the site and there was all these storms coming around on my, it's water-based paint. We don't need right now <laughs> for it to rain. And there were two times. There was that, that there were very crucial times. It was then, and there was another time when we'd actually, where, uh, the way we put the roof on, we had to put the jip rock, then we put the um, insulation, then we put the, um, we put the iron on top. And if it rained when just the jip rock was on, it was all going to fall in. And both of those times there was rain, and it actually was raining around us, but it was like we watched the cloud move around us and then hit. And we stayed, I think, at our daughter's place that night, only 10 minutes up the road. It was pouring down with rain, but it didn't actually rain here. And there was another time when we were, um, we were at... Um, now, here, now, here's an interesting thing, because some people might say, well, if one person here is praying for rain, and someone over here is not praying for rain, how is that going to work, you know? <laughs> You know, and they're both sons of God, how's that going to work? Well, I'll tell you how it works. We were at Coolangatta, and we were at Coolangatta School, and we were having a um, carols night. And so we didn't need it to rain, because it was outdoors, and it was actually, um, we had equipment. And we were, if you know the distance, we were at Coolangatta School, and the airport, you know, it's, it's a minute by, you know, in a, in a direct route, it's a five minutes probably by car or less. It was raining at the airport, but it wasn't raining at the school. <laughs> so I believe one person on one side of the road can pray for rain, the other person can pray for dry, and God can do that. Amen? <laughs> because we've seen that actually happen. So I don't think though he answers prayers about football teams, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs>
So, um, you know, so creation is actually waiting for us to be revealed so that it can actually come out of bondage. And so, you know, this, this um, thing called, um, you know, the, the, the birth pangs, it says, um, we know that the whole creation is groaning and labours with birth pangs up to now. Now, naturally, I'm not, I'm not a, uh, uh, an expert on birth pangs. <laughs> I've got children, but I didn't deliver them. <laughs> but what I know about labour pains is that they start, but then they get stronger and they get stronger until, and more frequent, and it's the contraction of the muscles until you know, the, the actual birth comes. Now, in Matthew, it says that when we see the sort of things we're seeing right now, it's the beginning of birth pain. So let me read it to you, Matthew 24, verses 3 to 14. Now, keep in mind that we've just read in Romans that the whole of creation is groaning under these, these labor pains. And so Matthew 24, 3 to 14 says, Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately and said, Tell us when we will when these things will be and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age. And Jesus answered them and said, Take heed that no one deceives you. Is there a lot of deception in the world right now? Yes. Absolutely. Many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive. Is that happening? Absolutely. There's a, uh, there's a local, um, there's a place not far from here that um, he's passed away now, but that he was basically like the Christ, the others were his disciples. I think there's one in Queensland as well. And you will hear of wars and rumours of wars. You will see that, see that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So we are seeing that, but, the, but Jesus said, don't be troubled about it. Amen. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places. And that word pestilence means the disease, by the way. So COVID-19 would fit into that bracket. And then he says, all these are the beginning of sorrows. And if you've got the uh, RSV, Revised Standard Version, or Rob Stuller Version, whichever you want to call it, it actually says that these are the beginning of birth pains. Okay? It's not the birth pains, it's the beginning. It's when they start, which means, if we look at what that means, it means that, that it is the start of it, it will increase, it will intensify, and then we'll give birth to something. Amen? Hallelujah? What's it going to give birth to? The coming of Jesus. Alright? But he said, when you see this, it's the beginning. So, don't be surprised if what we're seeing now gets stronger and intensifies and even gets more painful. Because women who've had babies, yes, <laughs> that's what happens. And so Jesus has told us that that's what's going to happen. But Paul tells us in uh, Romans that this is the whole of creation is groaning and laboring. That's actually what's happening. We're going to explain that a bit more in a minute. So then it says, they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. You'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. That may not be happening now, not being killed, hated, hated by nations or hated by people, maybe. But you go to places like India and they're being killed. They've been killed for their faith. And I've, I've spoken to pastors over there who have been attacked, who have been abused, and people that have know are people that have been killed. So that is happening there. And then many will be offended and will betray one another, will hate one another. Many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because of lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end will be saved, and the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. Amen? They're the ones we're going to look at. Jesus warns us, but he actually gives us an encouragement that this would be an opportunity. In Luke 21 it says, this is an opportunity for you to witness. Why? Because people see you as a son of God. Because the more that this happens... The more lawlessness there is, the more this happens on the world, the brighter you shine. Who knows that the darker it is, the brighter you shine. Amen? If this room was completely dark, you just got to light a little match and it actually dispels the darkness. 
So the more that you are being changed from glory to glory in the midst of darkness, the more that you shine, the more you become appealing and people will want to know. Do you know there's coming a time where you won't even have to witness people be asking you, what is different about you? I need what you have. Amen? Because your glory will just shine greater and greater. Amen. So let's talk about this whole thing of creation groaning. In Romans 8.22 it says, We know that the whole creation groans and labours with birth pains until now. Not only that, but we ourselves also have the first fruits of the Spirit, and even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adopt adoption and redemption of the body. So, now it's interesting because... There's two words here. It says, we know that creation groans. And then later it says, we ourselves grow. They're two different Greek words. The first one in verse 22 is sustenzazo, which means groans together. And then the second one in verse 23, uh, stenazo, actually just means to grow. So it's saying that the whole of creation is groaning together. And then, in the same about birth pains, and then Matthew explains what those birth pains are. It's the, you know, the, because what happened is that when Adam basically handed the world over to, um, to Satan, the world actually came, you know, came under sin, and the whole earth is groaning, waiting to come back to creation order. Amen? Waiting to come back to perfect order. Waiting to come back. Do you remember what was Adam called? Son of God. He was actually called, he was the first one called the Son of God. And so when, when, when the earth was made, everything was perfect, everything was in perfect order, but then it actually was subjected to sin, and since then it's been in disorder. And the world is actually waiting for the revealing of the sons of God, groaning under labour, waiting to come back to, be rebirthed back to how it was in the Garden of Eden. Amen? And the Bible says that those birth pains are actually coming out in things like wars and rumours of wars and pestilence and uh, famines and all the things that the earth has been subjected to because of sin and it's groaning under the weight of wanting to be released from sin. Amen? So the creature is wanting to be released from sin and creation is wanting to be released from sin. How's that going to happen? By the revealing of the sons of God. The more that we were revealed as the sons of God, we have the answer that actually brings people out of bondage and actually brings creation out of bondage. Amen? To the point when the birth will come, which is actually Jesus Christ coming back again. Amen. Does that make sense? Okay. Let me talk a little bit further. So, in this one in verse 23, where it says, Not only, but, not only that, but we have the first fruits of the Spirit, and we grow. So what's happening in the earth is actually happening in us because we're restricted by an earthly body. But we have a spirit that actually comes from heaven. So, so the earth is groaning because it knows how it should be. We're groaning because we are restricted by this earthly body. And we're waiting to be for our spirit to actually have a heavenly body which will actually more line up with what is the glory that's inside of us. See, the Bible says we're earthly vessels with the glory of God. So when you got, when you accepted Jesus Christ, and then it talks about, and you're filled with the Spirit, there's, heaven is inside of you, but it's restricted to an earthly body. Does that make sense? And so we grow. Um, we have something heavenly placed inside something that is earthly. And our spirit groans waiting for the redemption of our bodies to be fully clothed from heaven. And um, we are we inside are changing to be more like Jesus and our bodies are longing for the day when we will actually have our bodies that match what's inside of us. In the meantime, there's a groaning that takes place. Can you identify with that? Um, so... <laughs> We're all looking forward to our heavenly bodies. Amen. <laughs> 1 John 3 verse 2 says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. 
But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Isn't that amazing scripture? It's saying that, um, you know, we, it's not been revealed who we are, but we know that when we see him, we will be changed to be like him. So here's an interesting thing, and I've done a similar demonstration before. Do you know that Jesus is multidimensional? Okay? There's, um, heaven is multidimensional. In fact, scientists now say that they believe, you know, we, we talk about um, you know, a single dimension, two dimensional, three dimensional. Um, the Bible actually talks about four dimensions. But do you know that scientists now believe there's up to 11 dimensions? So they've, they've actually scientifically discovered there's up to 11 dimensions. In fact, they say that what we have here is only a simulation of what is actually real. We know that. The Bible tells us that. So the thing is, is that we may live in a three-dimensional world, but we have a spirit that longs to be multidimensional. Mm -hmm. And one day we'll have a body that is actually multidimensional because we will see him as he is. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So... Here's the disciples in a room, and Jesus appears, and then he disappears. You know, the, the people say he walked through walls. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible said he appeared amongst them. Okay? So let me show you a demonstration. So, so this ball, so this, this plane here is two-dimensional, okay, because it's flat. Um, but this ball is actually three-dimensional. So... If I threw this ball, a three-dimensional ball, into a two-dimensional plane and it, it bounced, in two-dimensional it would look like a dot that appears and then disappears. Does that make sense? Because once the, the ball, three-dimensional ball, hits a two-dimensional plane, it, all, all you would see is that mark and then it would bounce out and that mark would go. Does that make sense? Yeah? I think I've lost a few people. Okay. So, how could Jesus just appear in a room and disappear? Because he's multidimensional. He appeared into a three-dimensional world and then went back into his multidimensional world. And do you know that when we will, one day, the Bible says when we see him, we will be as he is. So everything that he is, we will be. So, and here's the exciting thing. So when we get our heavenly bodies, they'll be multidimensional and then we will actually come back and rule and reign in a three-dimensional world in multi-dimensional beings. Isn't that amazing? Woo! Hallelujah! <laughs> so, when you read that and it says that, um, Beloved, we are children of God, has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Amen? We'll be changed in the twinkling of an eye. And that word revealed in the Greek means to make actual and visible and exp exposed to view. So people walking down the street may not see you as a multi-dimensional being, but the thing is, is that you have a multi-dimensional spirit. You have a spirit inside of you that is groaning and waiting for the actual bodies that, are about, that we're going to get. Amen? And they'll see it then. But you know what, they can sense it now because you are still, you have the Spirit of God inside of you and the glory of God being revealed from you. Amen? Yeah. You can, and so they, you can bring change. Now, now listen to this, this is interesting. So the Spirit in us grows because of the limitation of the bondage of the flesh and this earthly body that was placed upon it at the fall. And the whole of the earth is waiting for the revealing of the sons of God because it too was in bondage because of the fall. So the creature and creation are in bondage because of the fall. Now, walking through the mall or in a street and you see someone who's disabled and so limited, a part inside of you just wants to see that person experience total freedom. Do you understand what I'm saying? When I see someone in a wheelchair or if I see someone disabled, I work with a disabled boy. My, my heart goes out towards them because inside they're as normal as you and me but they're restricted by their body. Does that make sense? And so a part of you groans or grieves for that person because they're restricted into everything they can be by their body. And it's no different for us. Our, we've got a spirit, we've got heaven inside of us, but this body is, is, has its earthly restrictions. Now, do you, um, 
There are at least two incidents in the Bible where Jesus groaned before a miracle took place. So we're going to have a look at that because Jesus groaned in his spirit. So the first one is in John 11 and verse 32 to 45. It's actually around with uh, Lazarus. So if you um, go into your Bibles, John 11, 32. It says, Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. <laughs> now, can you see the restriction straight away? Is, they're trying to put a restriction there. Saying, well, Jesus, if you, you, you would have had to be here. If you were here, he wouldn't have died. Jesus knows that's not true. He doesn't have to physically be there in his body for a miracle to take place. But anyway, he said, therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews came with her weeping, he groaned in his spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid? So do you see that? He groaned in his spirit because they, they were looking at things from a natural plane, from a restricted point of view. And Jesus said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. And then Jesus said, see how they loved him. And you know, they're thinking he's weeping because he loved them. He's actually weeping because of, he's, in, he's in trouble. He's troubled in his spirit because of um, their you know, restriction, restriction in their mind. And some of them said, could not this man have opened the eyes of the blind and kept this man from dying? And Jesus, again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and the stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said, Lord, by this time there's a stench. <laughs> Do you think if Jesus can raise him from the dead, he can deal with the smell? <laughs> I think so. He said, he's, he's dead. You know, he's been dead for four days. It stinks. And Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Amen. You'd see the doxa of God. And then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted his eyes and listened to this. Father, I thank you that you've heard me. Isn't that interesting? When he groaned in his spirit, the Father heard <laughs> And then he says, and I know you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing here, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. So he spoke out loud, but he didn't need to even utter words for, the, for the, his spirit that was groaning, his father actually heard it. And he, and he who died came out bound, hand and foot, with grey clothes, his face was wrapped with a cloth, and Jesus said to them, Loosen him, let him go. And many of the Jews had come to Mary, they had seen these things that Jesus did, and they believed in him. See, I believe that's what we're going to see on this earth. Amen. Mm -hmm. As the, all that happened was the glory of God in him was different to the restrictive mentality of those around him. He groaned in his spirit, God heard him, delivered Lazarus, but he actually just said the words come forth so those around him would actually understand. So he groaned in his spirit, he groaned in himself, he said, I told you, you would see the glory of God, and he thanked the Father. See, here's the thing, we can, his prayer was, thank you, Lord, that you've heard me. You know, when we, when we groan in our spirit, and when we're, we're praying in our spirit, then all we need to do in English is say, thank you, God, that you've heard me. I talked about that the other week on, in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, is that when we pray in the spirit, that, that groaning, that praying, that there's a point where you just know that God has actually heard you. And then our English prayers can just be, thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you that you've heard me. Thank you for the, that we're going to see good report. So he's thanking the Father that he had heard his deepest, most longing in his spirit, and many believed. Amen? Here's another one, Mark 7, 32 to 35. It says, they brought out to him one who was deaf, who had a speech impediment. And they begged him to put his hand on him. And he took him aside from the multitude and put his finger in his ears and spat and touched his tongue. And then he looked up to heaven, he sighed, and he said to him, The Father, that is, be opened. So immediately his ears were opened and, and the impediment of his tongue was loose and he spoke plainly. The verse is not as easily seen here, but the, in verse 34 where it says he looked to heaven and sighed, it's the Greek word stenazo. It's the same word that Paul uses in Romans 
that say that says that our, the creation grows and we within ourselves grow. And so Jesus looked to heaven and in his spirit groaned, and then he said, Be opened, and the man could hear. So you know, the, the Bible says that we, we groan with you know, um, words that cannot be uttered because the Spirit makes intercession for us. So as we understand that, we're, that you understand you're a son of God, that you walk in your new creation identity, people and creation are waiting for you to be revealed. I mean, how thank, I'm so thankful that you know, my mum led me to the Lord. You were so thankful that somebody, that you saw a difference in somebody else and, uh, and they led you to the Lord and brought you out of bondage. Amen? And that's, that's what the, the gospel is about, about having relationship with people and being able to share you know, about the glory of God. And so people in creation are waiting for you to be revealed, to take people in creation out of bondage of the enemy. And this is present tense and future tense. We don't have to wait for our glorified bodies. In fact, it's gonna, it'll be too late <laughs> because to bring other people out of bondage. I mean, now is the time to bring people out of bondage. Now is the time to let the glory that's inside of us be revealed and touch those people who are around us. And our spirit groans waiting for our new bodies to match our inward life. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. I can't wait for my glorified body. I'm awesome. I, I think that'll be awesome when you know, we'll, we'll be um, in Jerusalem and, and Jesus will say, Rob, I need you to go to Sydney right now. I go, bang, I'm there. <laughs> we don't have to wait about travel restrictions. <laughs> we won't have any. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. So Lord, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord God, that we are your sons. And the only reason that we are is because you died on the cross, Lord God. And that you took away our sin, gave us your righteousness, called us your sons. And Lord, and sons and daughters. And we just thank you for that, Lord God. Lord, may we not take that lightly. But Lord, we just thank you that your Holy Spirit is transforming us and sanctifying us. So that your glory can just be more revealed. As John the Baptist said, that he might decrease, that you might increase. Increase in our lives, Lord God. Lord, you were, when you walked on this earth, you were so attractive to everybody, Lord. They, they reached out to you. They wanted to be around you. They wanted to hear what you said. They wanted to be healed by you, Lord God. They just wanted to be around you because of the glory of God that is upon you and in you and display, Lord. And Lord, I just pray, Father, the same for us, Lord, as your glory increases, Lord, that people will desire... Lord, the desire of nations that is in us, Lord, and desire to be free, Lord, from the bondage of this world, Lord. And Lord, we just thank you that even creation itself will be, uh, will be um, set free from this bondage. And what we're seeing now, Lord, is even the birth pains for the fact that you are going to be revealed and that we are going to be revealed. We look forward to those days, Lord, but, even, but as we walk in this earth now, that you might be revealed in us, Lord, and that we see people set free. In Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Amen.